Hello everyone. Um, I hope you're doing fine and having a great time. Um, so I'm recording this lecture, not making it live because of uh, time shortage. Um, what we want to talk about today is crystal plasticity modeling and its implementation using um, the mask. So um, this is a very interesting topic uh, and we will see why. Again, I want to inform you that Professor Pral is responsible for this subject. Uh, Dr. Irani and me, um, Faisal Kuyum, are helping him delivering these lectures and answering all the questions and um, helping the students getting to know a little bit more about um, this subject. So yeah, here we are today. Um, I will use pen. So yeah, here we are today. Multi-scale crystal plasticity modeling and implementation using Damask. Um, I've written here that it is lecture 14 because I believe 13 will be the one, um, this one, which I will deliver in person. And then because of the Christmas holidays, we were not able to um, make it here, but we are making it here. And then only one um, topic, artificial neural networks and simulation will remain. And we will see how we proceed with that. Um, so you would have studied a lot about um, numerical simulations and what they can tell us and all those things. Usually when we talk about numerical simulations of sheet metal forming, of bulk deformation forming, of forging, of rolling, we need um, material parameters. So what we do is we test a material, we collect the f um, um, we collect the stress strain curve um, or the flow curve of the material. We know the density, we know the conduction, convection, and 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 and, and all and all those parameters, and we give them as an input to different tools, and then they can tell us uh, the amount of stress with respect to corresponding strain, amount of stress in different directions, and. Uh, deformation and so on and so on and material flow velocity and many other things. Um, but all these properties of materials are actually depending on the microstructure of the material. Uh, and that is what crystal plastic simulations are all about. So if you look here, we are all familiar with the mechanical properties of metals, their stress strain behavior and so on. So a material, if it is brittle, will basically more or less remain in this elastic zone. But if a material is um, um, a material is elastoplastic, it will um, be in the elastic zone and then in the plastic zone. And of course, the brittle material will absorb less energy and a ductile material will absorb more amount of energy. And um, materials can undergo large deformations and can have a high stress handling capacity um, um, for example, in the case of cars. And such materials are easy to form in desired shape. Um, they depict good service life and have high energy absorption capacity during crash. So we need materials which have high, um, which have high um, um, energy absorption capability um, for uh, during, during deformation. Uh, for several many applications and what we will do here is basically um, uh, analyze the mechanical behavior of materials which is influenced by microstructural attributes um, so here we will not talk about the bulk deformation behaviors but rather we will talk about a very local area of a material and, and, and just remember that we will be talking about these materials at the microstructural scale throughout the presentation. So in the crystal plastic stimulations, we are dealing with the locality of the material. So how um, and, and does the material behave um, at a very local scale where we are, we can resolve the material into different grains and different phases, and we can look at them separately, and um, and um, and that is where we will be. Um, and that is where we will be uh, going through this work. So yeah, when we want to model a material at this um, scale, 
what we want to do is um, we want to see that um, what how does the material depend on these conditions um, so the deformation of the material um, as we know is dependent on composition of the material the grain size or orientation distribution manufacturing technique employed um, um, deformation degree and strain rate working temperature chemistry of the constituents and these are many different parameters which affect the overall material deformation behavior and some parameters are um, interdependent out of these and we still do not have a complete understanding of the effect of material parameters and their interdependence and therefore we want to um, model materials in a way that we can um, predict how these microstructural changes will affect the material behavior so what we do is we run the simulations based on um, real uh, numerical simulation we need a numerical simulation model which is based on real physical microstructure is flexible for modeling single or multiple phases uh, is dependent on the composition of the material is also dependent on the grain orientation of the material um, so this is basically how the crystals in a specific grain are aligned um, uh, with respect to the frame of reference and then there are several other possibilities in the material for example it can be pro the the material can be processed the material simulation can be processed to obtain global deformation or twin transformation if there is that um, and then we not only want to get the global behavior with respect to um, we not only want to get the average behavior of, um, of of these attributes but rather we also want to get the local behavior of this material and how we do it is um, we get um, um, depending on the detailed problem definition depending on if the RVE was resolved enough the representative volume element we can get um, local um, strains we can get local stresses we can get local orientation change we can get twinning or transformation and other local attributes if there are any so there would be many terminologies which would be unfamiliar for you this is just a quick background of what we are what we want to model um, just to quickly recap so here I would have asked several questions but just to quickly recap um, the material behavior is depending on the material microstructure um, and in the in the ideal world if we want to get the desired material behavior we would want to engineer the microstructure of the material in a way that it behaves like we want it to um, so what we are doing here is instead of running bulk deformation simulations instead of putting the material under the machine and trying to find out the properties what we are doing here is we are modeling the material at a very local scale at a crystal scale where every phase is independently present with its own characteristic attributes and attitudes we define the behavior at that scale and from there we try to predict how the bulk material would behave and these are the kind of models which are very useful for um, understanding and engineering materials for the desired applications um, so yeah that that's the overall overview and now we will um, go a bit into detail about what is crystal plasticity um, so you know that metals have a crystalline microstructure for example um, metals can have a face hundred cubic uh, microstructure or a, or a body hundred cubic microstructure or a hexagonal crystal structure and so on but we are taking here example of face hundred cubic and body hundred cubic um, crystal structures so in these are in, in these kind of crystal structures basically um, the atoms are located at different positions in a cube and in the in the in the fundamentals of materials course you would have studied that um, what are the attributes of these crystals what is the distance between the atoms and so on and then what are the um, what are the uh, compact planes and then um, on on which it is easier for the um, 
for the slip to occur and so on and so on so yeah metals have um, um, crystalline microstructure and when we apply load on them um, what happens is that there are two kinds of deformations and the first one here um, you can see that uh, it is only elastic deformation where the atoms do not change their position with respect to each other but rather their um, the, the the distance or the bond between them is slightly elongated so if you will remove the force here the atoms will uh, come back to their original position and the material will seem like it has not been deformed um, but on the other hand if we apply extensive force what will happen is that on the on the slip systems which are more which which have lower activation energies what will happen is that the atoms will slip on those systems uh, on, on on those planes and based on that there will be a permanent deformation in the material and if we will remove the force the material will not come back to its original position then we are talking about figure two here and this is the plastic deformation this is the fundamental mechanism of how plastic deformation takes place so there are dislocations in the material and those dislocations the atoms move step by step on those dislocations and eventually a whole plane slips across another plane and a permanent deformation that is how a permanent deformation takes place and there are millions and millions of um, uh, dislocations on which when we apply external load the atoms are constantly moving there are different attributes associated to dislocation so they pin together they they inhaliate together they add up together and there are many possibilities by which this takes place but this is a very fundamental way in how plastic deformation takes place which is very simply easily explained by this schematic here now this is this is the behavior of the material which we want to model but instead of 2d we want to do it in 3d so remember when we talked about the um, when we in the last slide when we saw the material crystal structure so here you see different um, uh, slip systems in a crystal um, so for uh, for the case of body centered cubic um, for the case of body centered cubic um, crystal structure we see that um, the the slip systems are 110 plane 211 plane and 321 plane where 110 and 211 plane are the most um, 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 are, are, are the planes which are more prone to um, deformation um, and then in the FCC system face hundred cubic system we have one 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 plane and one one zero directions on which um, the deformation can take place um, and this plane is shown here so um, in this case we will have um, several um, slip systems and then many other slip planes in this case we will have one two three four um, four um, slip planes and then many many slip systems across them and then there is also case of hcp shown uh, where um, this uh, uh, basal and perpendicular slip planes are already present here so the slip uh, can take place on these um, closed back um, planes so what so it is important to understand um, the effect of uh, critically resolved um, shear stress here so um, at, in an in a 3d material in 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 a 3d material what happens is that um, there is this um, slip plane uh, there is this crystal orientation and based on that there is this slip plane which is shown here which is shown here um, and it is present at a certain angle with respect to the applied force so it is not perfectly perpendicular it is always a certain angle and then there is critically resolved shear stress which can be calculated using Schmidt's law critically resolved shear stress is this value here and it depends on the amount of stress 
which is can be calculated here stress is force per unit area um, and then cause of phi where phi is this uh, slip plane normal and then this lambda where lambda is this slip direction in which the material will deform so theoretically resolved shear stress depends on the crystal orientation if it is a cubic crystal that is oriented at 45 degree to the loading axis. Um, um, so then the critical resolved shear stress will be um, will be maximum. So that would mean um, that the maximum stress will be present on the plane and it will deform it significantly. But if the crystal is oriented at zero degrees or 90 degrees, for example, if this plane is perfectly like this or perfectly like this, if you put those values here, the critical resolution stress value will be very small, which will mean that even if you apply a lot of load, there is no not enough stress on the slip plane so it can deform it. So that slip plane will not really move. For the deformation to take place, applied resolved shear stress must be greater than the critical resolved shear stress. So yeah, the, here is a condition here, which means that um, stress should be greater than TRSS. Um, and we are talking about a plane. Um, so critical resolved shear stress depends on crystal type uh, solid solution strength and temperature. It is also important to understand this, uh, that apart from this um, angle, it also depends on crystal type, solid solution strength and uh, um, temperature of the material. Now, let's summarize what we have studied so far. So we have understood that metals have a crystalline structure and um, plastic deformation in crystalline structure takes place due to dislocation glide, um, which takes place on the act, which takes place due to the activation of slip planes. Um, and then we have studied that some crystalline planes are more prone to dislocation glide than the other, and these are called um, slip planes. And the deformation occurs in slip directions. For the deformation to take place applied resolved shear stress must be greater than the least critical resolved shear stress for a certain slip plane on a certain direction. Um, and then we know that hardening takes place due to dislocation pinning and reduction in mean free path. Um, so when the dislocations continuously move and they lock each other, then further dislocations cannot move through that and the material slowly gets hardened. So then more force is required to move those dis same dislocations. Um, and the problem becomes more complicated with polycrystalline material microstructure. So usually we do not have only one crystal in a material. We have multiple um, um, polycrystalline microstructures. Um, so that would mean that every grain ha is differently oriented and there are different slip planes activated with the applied load and some are high and some are low and, 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 and then they move and the orientation of the material grain changes. and based on that then for the further applied load then it behaves differently to solve such a complicated problem we define a model for crystal plastic and make all the calculations instead of doing them by hand because that is just very difficult so the basis of crystal plasticity modeling are that a deformation gradient is resolved the total deformation of the material is resolved into its elastic part and its plastic part um, and this plastic deformation component can be investigated by using this term where we have this plastic deformation rate and plastic velocity gradient um, 
now this plastic velocity gradient can be um, found out using this term here but let's not go there let's talk about the elastic behavior so the elastic behavior of the material depends on the applied um, uh, stress and elastic deformation component which um, the uh, constants so these are this is a matrix of that how the material would behave in a stress will be applied and from here we can calculate this fe and for the plastic velocity um, gradient we have this term which um, requires resolved shear um, and then different slip directions and then this is basically um, the orientation of um, each point um, and then these are the slip directions now this resolved shear stress ca is calculated um, using this formula um, so this m is normal to slip plane and n is slip direction um, now and this alpha are slip systems now this resolved shear stress is depending on this shear rate um, critically resolved shear um, and apply uh, and the applied shear or we call it the reference shear here and M is a fitting parameter which we can adjust now this critical resolved shear stress is being calculated using this term which has this hardening matrix and um, this slip resistance term and this hardening matrix is being calculated by using this formula where we have uh, different um, hardening parameters and different fitting parameters um, and uh, and so on so this is a relatively um, complicated model in which we are um, um, calculating the the uh, elastic and plastic parts of deformation in the material and then uh, based on um, how different slip planes would um, deform and with respect to the, what is the critical resolved shear stress and what is the applied shear stress and based on that uh, we also have a hardening law which defines that how, with what capacity do the uh, do the slip planes harden now this whole methodology is implemented in um, in in um, Damask where we have this whole bulk of a material and for a very small point we um, define an elastic stiffness tensor we define the dynamic plastic flow we if we use that kind of model we use uh, kinematics of plastic straw um, we also define um, the constituents if it is single phase or multi phase and so on and uh, this input comes from a representative volume element and, uh, and so on and all this is uh, present in um, Damask now um, instead of um, showing you how Damask works or things like this I found it interesting that we can take a look at different um, case studies um, so what I have done here is I have summarized a relatively interesting case study um, for which what you can do is hmm, let's see for which what you can do is you can go and read about it 
on this link. Just wait. Uh, yeah. No. Not this one. This one. Yeah, so you can go and read about it. So this is the publication. You can look at the link here and um, you can look at the DOI here, the title here. So you can easily find it on Google Scholar or even if you will write this title on Google, you will find it. So this is a really nice publication about the work which I will try to explain here. And um, in this publication, you will find it in more detail how we did it, what were the steps and so on. And you will also find a lot of interesting results. But here we are, talk we are only talking about a general behavior and what we found out and how we did things. So therefore, I will not go into those details or I might miss a few details because I want to keep this lecture short. But yeah, you can go there and look at these details in, the, in that publication. So here we have uh, trip steel, magnesium, partial stabilizer, conia, metal matrix composite. Um, and what happens in this material is that <clears throat> the matrix of this material is um, metastable austenite. So austenite is not actually stable at room temperature, but here due to alloying of the elements, it is metastable. In it is in a metastable state. So austenite is at room temperature, but it is, but it is not stable. So when we start deforming it, it starts to transform into martensite. Um, and um, because the carbon content is higher, and with the um, with the slip planes deforming. What happens is that um, twins are generated, and in these twins, then martensite in, uh, originates. So you can see this in this picture below. And what happens? Um, and so what happened here was that my um, audio stopped working. <laughs> I checked my headphone, but um, yeah, I thought it was working, but the mic just stopped working. So these are the issues with technology. And um, in any ways, I tried to work with it. I checked if the volume was fine and I could read it. And then I just continued with the lecture. And um, so yeah, so now I'm doing a voiceover of the previous presentation. And here, uh, let's talk about this now. So the, um, the zirconia particles, which are used here in this material for the strengthening uh, also transform during deformation um, they go undergo martensitic transformation from one phase to another and um, these zirconia particles um, when we apply excessive load um, to um, absorb a lot of energy during deformation um, what happens is that um, these um, is there the the debonding around these zirconia particles takes place um, and um, that is um, important because here the material starts to um, material starts to damage and lose its attributes and properties. Um, so, yeah, um, that is what we want to model. And uh, what we have done here is that uh, we used crystal plasticity to model that. Uh, and here I have sh I'm showing you an example um, which is already um, published somewhere. Um, so here we see that um, the, the the austenite is shown in the IPF colors, and um, the distribution of zirconia particles is shown here. The grain size for both faces is 10 micrometers. It is a 2D geometry, um, and um, we used damage criteria for both phases. So ductile damage criteria for austenite, um, and um, brittle damage criteria for um, um, magnesium partially stabilized zirconia um, and 
um, yeah so we constructed this kind of microstructure um, using some RV generation tools and um, then we adopted them here um, So um, what we did here was that we applied um, loading on the material uh, along um, a horizontal axis. And you can see here that uh, due to this applied load, um, the deformed geometry is shown below, which stretches along the X direction and compresses along the Y direction. Um, the calibrated material model parameters were taken from already published data. Um, and the damage parameters were adopted from literature and calibrated to match with the experimental observations. Um, so here are the global results of uh, the study. So what, by global results, we mean that um, um, the results are averaged down. Um, the results are averaged down uh, for all the points and are shown here together in the form of uh, a graph and um, uh, you can see here that um, the, the material initially starts from zero and goes in the elastic range first and then at yield point um, it starts to deform in the um, plastically and that is where we are interested in the material behavior and um, during this um, um, plastic deformation when there will be enough deformation that the damage criteria will be fulfilled the material will start to uh, degrade so we see here the first point where the zirconia particle cracking took place because the particle is so large so this cracking creates a dent in the um, in the stress strain curve usually in our experiments when the material is quite bulk and huge these um, small blips in the stress strain um, curve are not really visible but here because the RV was too small we could see it and then we see that several blips are shown and then the damage is so much propagated that the material degradation is uh, progressing fast and this is basically the effect of damage on the stress and curve but we in this graph we explicitly plotted damage as well you can see it it is plotted between 1 and 0 0.95 where 1 is fully dense material and 0 0.95 is um, um, the the damaged material and we see that it the damage initiates and propagates um, and then we also see that the total dislocation density is increasing the gamma to um, the gamma to martin side uh, transformation is also increasing so these are the trends which we get from our um, so these are the trends which we get from the global um, processing of the simulation results which means that we have averaged all the results but that is not but that is not um, enough so um, what we can also do is we can process these results um, 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 locally um, and that is what we did here so look at so we want to look at the results on every pixel and how they are evolving with time um, so in this slide we uh, very nicely see here that uh, the damage initiates on the interface uh, in between the two zirconia particles where the interface is very minimum and uh, because of that uh, the the strain between these particles excessively increases um, and the dislocation density is also quite high and then we see that the damage continues to propagate and we see the amount of true strain which is continuously increasing uh, significantly and then we also see the, the amount of dislocation density rising in this area so these are basically the local um, results we call them local because they are based on um, the the actual position and locality of things and now let's look at for the same RV for the same simulation let's look at different results so we see that the stresses in um, um, zirconia particles continuous significantly rise and then when the damage initiates the there is stress relaxation between those zirconia particles um, and and we see that due to uh, damage initiation and propagation there is stress relaxation 
and it moves in other d different certain directions um, and um, yeah uh, so we also see that the phase transformation continues to increase now there is a very complicated um, play of all these attributes and things which are happening in the material during deformation and that is what we explored in this uh, work and in this research um, so yeah we for the local damage evolution we see that um, i have processed some pictures where the damage initiated so we saw that at 9.6 percent strain and 400 mpa this damage initiated between the zirconia particles and on the um, matrix um, and um, particle interface and slightly at higher slightly higher strain at 13.3 percent strain and 480 mpa uh, stress we see that the void nucleation in the matrix at triple points of the grains with high schmidt factor also initiates so we see that the damage in the matrix also starts to initiate and propagate and then we see that um, uh, the damage propagation is in preferable shear planes grows to um, join together and form these uh, damage planes and um, yeah and the zirconia particles cracking takes place and then if we go further at the highest level where the stress due to stress relaxation it reduced to 450 mpa and at 16.2 percent strain we see that there is significant amount of damage in the material and the zirconia particles generally crack perpendicular to the loading direction and so on and that is what is what we have done here so we um, uh, see here that uh, the damage in the zirconia particles is generally perpendicular to the loading axis uh, at some points it is oblique uh, but generally it is at um, um, uh, at perpendicular directions to the loading axis and then at uh, in the matrix at most of the points um, the damage is parallel uh, is damages at oblique angle usually around 45 degree to the loading axis you can see all these lines which were constructed uh, to uh, to make this point and what we did here was that we compared our results with the already published data and you can see here that in experiments it was also observed that the damage on the um, metric uh, damage in the uh, matrix particle interface is initiated and propagated at 45 degree to the loading axis whereas the damage in the zirconia particles is perpendicular to the loading axis where the loading axis is basically parallel to the slide um, horizontal to the slide so yeah the the crystal plasticity results match well with the experimental observations um, and here you will see that the outcome i constructed this figure quite nicely to show um, how the crystal plasticity simulations can be helpful in understanding the overall bulk deformation material behavior locally so we can see um, there is stress uh, that the, the stress zones um, the the strain zones um, the, the damage uh, the convolution of damage at different points uh, with respect to the second phase particles and this is a very interesting figure which shows how all the different um, all the different phenomena interplay play to um, f for this complex material behavior uh, this figure is not specifically from this work but very closely resembles uh, in a 3d space on what is happening throughout the material um, at different points so yeah this is uh, today's lecture this is uh, what I wanted to discuss with you today from my side and um, yeah so um, if you have any questions please write them to us and in the next week uh, will be the last week of lectures and where we will discuss everything and so on and um, yeah um, thank you very much for your time and effort and um, see you in the next lecture then if you have any questions just stay and if you don't have any questions it's still completely fine and okay um